<clears throat> oh, hi, Cuzzy. Hi, Jesse. How are you going? Hi, Lucinda. She's scared to go. Oh. No my I my Tenakoto Tenakoto Tinatato Katua No te Fanganui Atara Aho Ko Nati Pakia Toku Iwi Ko Tom Taku Inua Kia ora, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Doy, coming to you live, 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 live from Palmerston North in the middle of the mighty Manawatu. Yay. It is my heartfelt, hyperbolic pleasure to be the virtual host of this virtual book launch for Laura Jean McKay's astounding, disturbingly prescient novel, The Animals in That Country, out now with Scribe Publications. Woohoo! And virtual claps, virtual claps. Kia <laughs> everyone. I would like to acknowledge that this launch, notwithstanding its, its virtual aspects, is taking place in large part on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people in the Kulin Nation, and on the traditional lands of Indigenous nations all across the continent that we now call Australia. I want to pay my respects to Indigenous elders past, present and future. Um, sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be. Aboriginal land. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're living through an extraordinarily strange, unsettling, frightening event. I hope you're doing okay wherever you are. Take care of yourself and your bubble buddies and that you have plenty of toilet paper. <laughs> now, I don't want you all to get too excited, but I've been told that this is the first ever virtual book launch in the world. <laughs> We're making history here, people. Um, so could someone please uh, fact check for that for me and put it up on the screen? But I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure first time ever, first ever virtual launch um, of the animals in that country. Apparently, this is what happens if you are Laura Jean McKay, Doctor of Animal Studies, and you use your next level powers of imagination, spending far too long writing far too well about a world upending flu pandemic. Your delirious vision leaks out into real life in the form of a feverish bat and infects the entire planet. Either that or this whole thing is some way too elaborate publicity stunt. Note to self, uh, write non-terrible viral marketing joke. <laughs> um, and once the book is officially launched, we can call the whole thing off and go to the pub. <laughs> or... <laughs> It's just really, really, really strange timing. So, what happens at a virtual book launch? You'll be pleased to know that it's almost exactly like an IRL book launch. Except, if the speeches drag on, you can just talk over the top of them without anyone even noticing. Unless you, can, unless you type your comments into the chat box, <laughs> which you'll find in the bottom right-hand corner. You can practice heckling me right now, as some of you have already started. Great. <laughs> Also, uh, if you try to clink your champagne flute with Laura, you might break your webcam. But that shouldn't stop you from trying. And there will be champagne, as long as you've already got some in your prepper bunker. So make sure it's chilled and ready to go. We'll pop it a little bit later. All right, so in a moment, you'll hear from uh, Cora Roberts, the scribe publicist extraordinaire, there in your screen in the middle. Um, then you'll hear from the esteemed launcher, Sophie Cunningham. Woohoo! Woo. Um, and then from the woman of the hour, Ms. Zeitgeist 2020, Laura Jean McKay, um, who will say a few words and read an excerpt from the animals in that country. Um, then Cora will let you know again how to order the book immediately. Order the book, order the book, order the book. Um, and we're going to have a giveaway, um, and then we're going to try a virtual Q&A, which again, to my knowledge, is a world first, never been tried before, ever, um, where you type in questions and I log them to Laura, like friendly grenades. Um, and to round things off, we're going to have a virtual sing-along of our just oh-so-appropriate song. So just stick around for that. Look forward to that. Uh, so without... Do you think all we have to sing-along? 
I think we have a token troll. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so welcome. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think there's some of that going on. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear the moderation's working really well. <laughs> so without further ado, um, let's throw to Cora Roberts, who is the book publicist at Scribe Publications. Hi, everyone. This is amazing for me. It's like being in the future. Um, I thought the height of technology peaked when I got a remote control for my television and I didn't have to get up off the couch anymore. But this is advanced even from that. And here we are in a virtual world all looking at each other. Um, I'm so pleased that we've got together to launch this wonderful book. I've been working on the media campaign um, and it's been such a delight. I must say that I'm sad that we're not in person or in a bookshop. I'd like to pretend that we're in a cosy bookshop, maybe readings in Carlton or maybe Unity <clears throat> in Auckland and there's lots and lots of books around us and we're all drinking cask wine. And this actually is cask wine. I will not be shamed for cask wine. It is <laughs> that I'm keeping the flag flying. Um, there are some books, not that many, but a few, that I remember exactly where I was when I read them. And Laura's book is one of those. I first read it when it came in as a manuscript and it was big A4 pages. And I actually couldn't stop reading it. I was walking down Sydney Road, turning the pages, and I bumped into a pole. Then I got onto the train, and I still couldn't stop reading it. I got off at Flinders Street, and someone tapped me on the shoulder to say, oh, you've, lost, you've left your bag on the seat. I was so engrossed. Still, I couldn't stop reading it. I was going up the escalators, still in the crowd of people at um, peak hour. Still, I couldn't stop reading it. And when I finally met my friend under the clocks, I felt really annoyed that she'd intruded on my little world with Jean and Sue. And the memory of reading it has really stayed with me. And I think it's a wonderful book. Um, one thing that's different for an online book launch compared to a real book launch is obviously buying the book. There's a link to buy the book from readings in the email that went to you and you can buy the book there. Um, and people in New Zealand, I think it's hard for you guys to get books from shops at the moment, but you can get, get it online and then get it from your local bookshop um, when they reopen. Usually, if we were in real life together, I'd have a big stack of post-it notes and I'd be writing your names as you all lined up to have your book signed. Um, I'll tell you a secret. We say that that's so we get the spelling right the author writes in the front of your book, but it's actually because they can get frozen on the spot and forget your actual name. Remember your face, but they forget. <laughs> oh, this is my best friend from grade two. What's her name again? So we won't have that tonight. But Laura's going to handwrite notes um, to anyone who responds to Danielle, who sent you the launch invitation with your postal address and your name. Laura will do an inscription that you can then put in your book. Um, when you receive that. Um, Marika Webb-Pullman, the associate publisher at Scribe, commissioned this book and I'm just going to read a few words from her. Mm. Thank you everyone for coming to celebrate with Laura tonight. I'm devastated that my woeful rural internet connection means I can't be there, but I'm with you all in spirit. When I signed The Animals in That Country early last year, I could not have imagined the situation in which we'd be publishing, just months after the worst bushfires the country had ever seen and then into the middle of a global pandemic. These are surreal times and difficult for so many. And yet books have never seemed more important and Laura's in particular has never seemed more timely, prescient and relevant. And isn't that the mark of the best, most vivid and energetic fiction? one which asks us to imagine a world that is different to ours as it compels us to look at our own anew. Working with Laura on animals was an honour and Sue and Jean have now taken up permanent residence in my head. I can't wait to see how readers respond to this incredible book. Congratulations, Laura. That was from Marika. Thank you, Marika. Uh, Thank you so much, Cora. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Corey. That was great. Now, everyone, I'm just about to uh, introduce Sophie Cunningham, but now is also a great time to run and get your chilled champagne if you have any, because at the end of Sophie's speech, we'll have a toast. Um, but yes, now we're going to hear from Sophie Cunningham, who is the author of many books, including the recent and fabulous City of Trees, or as you can see right here in this version, you tick for suit. Sophie is a former publisher and editor, um, was a co-founder of the Stella Prize and is an adjunct professor at RMIT University's nonfiction lab. In 2019, Sophie was made a member of the Order of Australia for her contributions to literature. Um, so it doesn't get much better than this, more esteemed, uh, more Dane-like. So everyone, Sophie Cunningham. <laughs> Okay, I, I specifically requested that you not mention that, but thank you very much, Tom. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to leap in. I, 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 I was so thrown when you said this was the first ever in, in book launch by Zoom in the world that I've said <laughs> that's throwing me off my game. So <laughs> I'm, reading, I'm reading off my notes, <laughs> um, which is I'm usually least nervous in person. Okay. <laughs> This novel is so many things that I don't quite know where to start. Laura's use of language is perhaps the place. She builds a web of words, you find yourself caught in that web, and then the webbing turns into a cocoon that soon you forget there is a world outside it. I literally gasped when I finished the novel. It was, to wildly mix my metaphors, like being dumped by a wave. That sense of total absorption, then bam, we're done now, fuck off and be in the real world. This is a sweary novel and it makes you want to swear. The ending is miraculous in so many ways and ways I don't want to overly elaborate on for fear of spoiling the novel. But one of the ways the ending is miraculous is that it enacts the moment of conclusion as something that seems endless drawing to a close. And that recognition that you may not, in fact, want closure, though it's been all you can hold on to when you're deep inside an experience. So the novel's about many things, including the way, ways in which human beings as individuals and as a community can be shaken out of complacency by rapidly escalating events. The shakedown is not pleasant or expected, but it holds within it moments of such intensity that you could call those moments joyful. There's a sense of Jean, who's the main character, or one of the main characters, being forced to be so totally present to her situation that it is irrelevant whether that situation is good or bad. Spoiler alert, it's often quite bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, everyone listening will know, and, and it's, we've, people have said several times, how could you not know, that the animals in that country is about what happens when a woman and members of a kind of family find themselves struggling survival as a pandemic takes hold. It's not impossible, I'm sorry to, Tom, you, you stole my joke or I stole yours. It's not impossible that Laura, who I don't know very well but seems nice, is in fact very evil and has, with the help of the evil Cora and the evil publishing house Scribe, come up with the most kick-ass marketing campaign device in human history. And if that's the case, I salute your evil <laughs> and perhaps reconfigure it as amorality. For humans are animals and animals are, as this novel describes, capable of almost anything. But yes, another thing this novel is about in the literal plot sense is the symptoms of the flu that everyone is catching. And one of those symptoms is that people begin to hear animals talk. But whether they can actually translate or understand what they hear is another question. And an important plot point, it's also an important plot point whether or not people understand what they're hearing. And this takes us to some very dark places. Do we want to know that what pigs that have been fattened up for market and then left in a truck on the highway to die are thinking? No, we do not. We really do not. But this novel forces us to listen as Jean is being forced to listen. And the family member that Jean is listening to most, her family member, is the love of her life, her daughter, mother, goddess, a dingo called Sue. At this not le level, the novel is a love letter to dingoes. It's also a reminder not to fuck with dingoes. You'll discover this for yourselves as you read, but sue for Prime Minister, I say. Mm -hmm. Or Jacinda, frankly, from over here in Australia. <laughs> That's just an aside. <laughs> We're struggling here in Australia mm. on that front. Okay. So 
Um, as an aside, I teach creative writing and one of the things I was taken with was the craft of this novel, the simplicity at the centre center of it. I imagined Laura sitting at her desk in Victorian Bronte style, Emily Bronte, I was thinking, Emily Bronte style garb and a P2 mask on thinking, what if I took a pandemic novel novel line on a, on a, on the, and, and a road novel and a talking animals novel and then mashed them together? What, what then? And what then is amazing. Look, I can't, and I don't want to finish without paying my respects to the stylistic bravura, bravura of the novel. Um, I was saying to Laura before you all joined us, and I'm realised I'm seem to be looking darker and darker as the sun sets in Melbourne, so yeah, that's thanks to the gothic drama, I hope. <laughs> um, I, that because I, um, I only received the um, novel a few days ago. I read it more quickly than I wanted to because the language is just extraordinary and I pretty well aim to start reading it again tomorrow. But I found myself thinking at moments of The Wonderful Dog Boy, a novel by Eva Hornung, and actually then I saw that Laura mentioned that novel in her acknowledgements. That said, The Animals in That Country is more off the charts crazy than Dog Boy. <laughs> at times it's more poem than novel. And the sometimes minimal words and phrases gesture at so many meanings that it's both dazzling and at times confounding. Who is yesterday? Who is tomorrow? The Annals in the Country is about embodiment. It's about generational relationships. It asks, what is an animal? What is a family? It's about the disintegration and reintegration of language. It's about a whole new way of seeing and configuring the world. The Annals in That Country is, for the several hundred pages it, ha it has you in its web, about everything all at once. So since you can't go to the beach for a while, six months, that's what Scott Morrison is saying, read this and you'll, then you'll feel dumped and held under, then beach gulping for air by the end of it, and I promise you that you'll really feel like you've been at the beach. Okay, thank you. Oh, Sophie. Well, it, was, it was amazing. Thank you so much, Sophie Cunningham. Thank you, Sophie, that was great. Amazing. And thank you uh, for wearing your very best um, pyjamas as well, your happy little veggie mic pyjamas. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. It's a full, my mother gave me these pyjamas. It's a full happy little veggie mic outfit that, that I wore to celebrate the apocalypse. And Virginia, my beautiful assistant and wife, is going to... Oh, a ceremonial glass of champagne. Thank Excellent. You. This is a great time. Sophie, do you want to toast? Do you want to do a toast to Laura and the book? I think we should do it together, Tom, if, yes. if we can organise that. All for right. Technology. To, to, okay. to Laura Jean McKay and her absolutely astounding book, The Animals, or just say this slowly, <laughs> in that country. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. Sure, muzzle top. <laughs> oh. And all things. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bubble Buddy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks, Bubble Buddy. We'll explain what that means for people who don't know. Cheers and chin chin. Yeah, so in, in New Zealand, if um, whoever you are lucky enough or unlucky enough to be stuck with is your Bubble Buddy. Um, so they're the people you're allowed to fraternise with. Um, everyone else is the bottom, and so, so stay away. Cheers. 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 Clink. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So I think we're going to hear from the woman of the hour herself, Laura Jean McKay, right now. Laura is my bubble buddy. Um, she is the author of the book we are in the process of launching. Um, the Animals in the Country, as well as the short story collection Holiday in Cambodia, which I'm just going to plug it since it's... Oh, I can't see any copies of it. Anyway, a it's fine, sold fine out. book. Sold out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, take it away, Laura. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tom, um, host with the most. Cora, you just... From the moment we were first in touch um, and I made you uh, forget your purse on the train. <laughs> it's just been such a delight um, to be working with you. Thank you for your words and to Marika Webb-Coleman as well. Um, Sophie, 
oh my goodness, you are just the most miraculous person I think I've ever met. And um, that was just, I'm going to just watch that back um, again and again. Um, I think Sophie's speech will be available um, for us to all look at somewhere on the internet. Um, so, hi, um, tēnā koutou, now my hari mai, hello um, and welcome here. Uh, I want to deeply thank and acknowledge the traditional land that much of this book I'm launching tonight was written on. Um, see, I, I have to read things, I, don't let me go off script, I'm just going to read from this. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the land, the lands of the Wurundjeri people and the Watharong people of the Kulin Nation. And the book was also written on the traditional lands of the Kangaratung people and the traditional lands of the Larrakia people. I pay respect to Indigenous elders, past, present, and future, and also to the Maori people of Otaroa, whose land I live and write on today. Um, so these countries have seen a lot, um, and uh, now we're we're sharing a lot globally. These are heavy times. It's a bit strange to be launching a book into a pandemic. Um, is there anybody else? Maybe there's a few other authors out there who are also launching their book into a pandemic this week. It's made so much easier by the fact that I can practically hear you heavy breathing um, on your isolation screens out there. And I'm seeing your messages come through. Oh, there's Kim McKay, my darling cousin, um, I'm seeing your lovely messages come through, so keep on sending them. We've got 121 people joining us here on the screen. Um, we've got five Q&As lined up and lots and lots of chatting as well. Um, so um, I know that some of you probably dressed up quite special for this. You can see our happy little Vegemite. Um, they're in the bottom in the bottom screen having a rest. Cora Roberts um, put on some seriously fancy earrings. I have a, a pink powder suit. Um, but I'm just, oh, my pink powder suit, yeah. Annie Lennox inspired. Uh, but I'm just wondering um, who's wearing animal print out there. I know that Marika Webb Pullman, the publisher of this book, uh, was going to get out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a special um, a special shirt for this occasion. So pop your, oh, someone's got a brolga, oh, leopard print, someone's wolf whistling, wolfie, very nice, animal reference. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, PJs? Who's joining Sophie Cunningham in a pyjama party? Someone's got their cats. Oh, Jane Rawson has her cats watching along. Um, Frenny has dinosaurs. Uh, some people are so excited that it's kind of kind of time. It's just sort of like sweary, sweary bits. What about um, what about uh, birthday suits? You can't lie to me. I know that that someone out there. I know those under under trees are running around running around in, in their in their nappies um, if they're still up in Australia. Whatever you get up. Um, thank you so much for joining us here. Um, there's Many authors and publishers and bookstores forging ahead with pandemic publication. Um, your support means everything to us. Uh, get to your local bookstore Australians um, while you still can. It does shut down very quickly here in New Zealand. Um, we can't order books online. So, but um, someone was asking before whether the ebook was available. It's on ebook and it's on audiobook. Um, you can hear my voice in your ear for eight hours, should you so desire that. Well, just an hour now. <laughs> so here's my book. Um, it's called The Animals in That Country. It's about humans and animals and the places where we do and don't meet. Uh, it's backwards right now. You can read it forwards. Um, and ask the question, what would happen if we could understand what the animals were saying? Um, what do you think? the animals in your life are saying to you. Maybe you can pop that in the in the comment, comments box if you'd like. Um, what, and also what questions would you ask the animals in your life? Maybe the dog or the cat. Dane Rawson, I know you've got cats watching you there. What are they saying? Um, or maybe the birds in the trees outside when you go. Apparently they're saying feed me usually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lou jokes. 
Um, the incredible philosopher, French philosopher, Vincent Desprez, uh, has a great book called What Would Animals Say If We Asked the Right Questions? That, that's what you can call a book if you're a great French philosopher. Um, what Would Animals Say If We Asked the Right Questions? And I guess um, that sort of thing drives works like this. Um, and there are so many books that and and pieces that have inspired this one. Um, that's sort of what drives us forward. We're not answering questions, but we're asking, trying to ask the right ones, maybe. So I'm going to do a little reading now. Um, I just talked and missed all the great animal things. I'm going to have to go back and, and see what you said. <laughs> Um, I'm going to do a little reading. Um, I've got a note here that says singing training. I'm not entirely sure what that means, um, but maybe you'll find it out later. <laughs> um, if anybody has the book already, some books got delivered today. I'm reading from page 111 here. Um, you will get to see some funny faces. I'm not trying to pull these funny faces on purpose, but recently I was recording that really long audio book and, um, and I had to try and get the animals' voices right. That's what singing training means. My mum will be there knowing what this means. When you smile on the, on the, and, and you're just recording yourself, um, people can hear it in your voice. So I decided that Sue's voice, Sue would be a bit of a, have a smiling voice, even if her snout doesn't <laughs> shake that way. That's why I've got a big grin on my face when I read Sue's bit. So Jean, the human protagonist, has just gotten a little wasted. Um, Sophie mentioned before, earlier on, before this started, that the drinking in this book is shocking. <laughs> and um, Jean definitely loved the drink. She's gotten a bit wasted. She's lying under her table. There's some salty language in this kid, so just um, just put your fingers in your ears. <clears throat> Motherly. Big fucking dingo in my face. Yellow teeth set in deep black gums, tongue lolling, ears forever cocked. I sit up and bash my head on the other on the underneath of the table. Doesn't hurt so much as knocks me flat, a thumping sound. The animal gone. Sit up again, look around, and she's crouched by the fridge. A shit through my ears. Dingo dog. Fucking Sue. Flesh and blood yesterday. Get out, Sue. Go on. Not yet. And then right up to my face. Tomorrow. Get out, I told you. Her body half twist, twitches away, whispers. Tomorrow. Is not from the tin, don't fight. It's on the nose. The bingle on my head and the start of a killer hangover. Lie under the table, staring up at the flaking chipboard. An abandoned web. Sue chanting, fresh flesh. Tomorrow, get into it. Her body sings a picture of Kimberly, her granddaughter. The bruises on the girl's scrawny legs. To Sue... Kim stinks like the freckles not yet appeared on her skin, like the wee that will need to happen in an hour, like the washed sheets she slept on and the sting of adventurous fear when she took Lee's hand. No lock for mother, the metal tooth. Run for tomorrow. Look, I tell Sue like she's a normal person. Andy in my kitchen trying to sober me up with coffee instead of a living, stinking wolf who can remake my grandchild with the smells in her behind. If tomorrow is dingo for Kimberly, you can forget it. Morrow, out! Takes a big bag of courage for me to crawl from under that table and grab Sue with my bad hand. I nearly pass out from trying. Meat diet. Sue gives my hand a sideways sniff. Gnawing, the respectable smell. I get her by the rough and drag her with skittering nails over the lino to the front yard. Stay, I shout. She starts dancing, whining high and urgent. My mother was a little angry, full of off-road sand. Great, so glad we can fucking talk now. I shut the door on her. 
a combination of everything Sue, her yorps, her reek, whatever it is, gets through the gap under the door, hits me with meaning. I hang off the handle. The words tomorrow, tomorrow, open it up again. Tomorrow takes a lot of pause. Can't you see I fucked it up? My own boy took her. Stop blubbering fat tears. There, mother, there, yesterday. She points her nose like she's Skippy the bloody bush kangaroo, the ruff on her back raised, excited, not in anger or hunger. I wipe the snot and tears onto my forearm, peer down the road where she's pointing, where she's pointing to Kimberly again. Not the road, but Sue's every twitch and stink. Tomorrow and never there, shit on it. A tinge of small. An idea bubbles in my stupid brain. I get over to the camper, grab Kimberly's tiny blue sock from the bed, hold it out to Sue. The dingo comes around, sniffs. Mouth love. Good morning, tomorrow, a rabbit's dream goes south. Hello, plastic, eat your eyes out. Altogether, this makes up Kimberly, but not a Kimberly I've ever known. In Sue's drool and eyelids and pores, Kim is an animal, a stinky thing, but also patient, important. It's the stench of Kim's neck and the small catch in her throat before she talks. Kim is something about to happen. Sue keeps talking, but not as crazy. Her nose tells stories about Hello Bear, that soft plastic body covered in dribble. Slabbering sweat and a little bit of that ice knot. Songs about Kim, songs about a teddy bear, and also that stench of a note, South. Sue shoves her nose in the sock and back at the air, goes down the road a bit, sniffing, running alongside Sue's body like a river that won't funk its course, South. I shake my head. I'm soaked here, sozzled. I can't drive. The dingo lets out a wine and in it I'm the den to come back to and a poison pellet all at once. I see Kimberly again on Sue's tongue. Sue has my girl on her nose and hears me alone without so much as a, as a whiff. Useless, pissed. Please note lodged in my belly. The keys to the camper digging into my hip. Blood made of bourbon. Communing with whales. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Thank you. Laura. Excellent. Oh, I have so much more to say. All right, I'll let you stage left again. Good. 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 Seven to ten years, depending on when you think that books start being written. Um, but maybe it did actually start back in 2010 um, when I was walking along a bush path at night and I came face to face with a kangaroo. Um, some of you will have heard this story many times, but um, you can complain on the on the chat. But I can't I can't tell, so you have to just sit there and hear me say Okay, so I I'm walking down this bush path and I came face to face with a massive kangaroo and he, he was a bit taller than me. And we did this that awkward dance that people do in restaurants where you're both trying to go one way and then you both try to go to another and, and you're sort of dancing with each other. Um, and it's very awkward. And I should have been absolutely terrified. Um, this kangaroo was bigger than me and he should have been absolutely terrified of me too um, because of what we do to kangaroos. But we both found our directions and went our separate ways. And he hung around the house for a few days after that. Um, and uh, Miranda Burton, who I think is here, um, and I, we were living together in the bush and we thought maybe he was a rogue, um, separated from his mob and exhausted and was taking a break. And I felt this communication with him that was beyond words. Um, I didn't need more, but the more I thought about it, so often we do need more when, when we're looking at other animals. And what if we could share a language? Um, so the animals that influenced this book are many. Old Rogue King back there in the bush um, was probably the catalyst. There's a dingo called Elsie up in the Northern Territory Wildlife Park which is a place I'm forever thankful to for offering me a residency. Um, and the Martin uh, Bequest Travelling Scholarship funded that. Um, there's, market, market, there's Bucket Magpie. I don't drink much anymore. So. <laughs> really. 
go into my head. Um, there's Bucket Magpie, uh, who tended to sit on my keyboard with one claw hovering over the delete button. Um, so if there are omissions in this book, um, you can probably thank Bucket. I've dedicated this book to my mum, Anne Whisker. Hi, mum. And also to my Nana Hodson, who literally used to introduce herself to people as Nana. Um, so I won't say her first and, and loathe first name. Um, thank you so much to those two extraordinary grandmas. The protagonist, Jean, in The Animals in That Country, wouldn't exactly be given any awards for grandparenting, so she's not based on those two people, but her heart and endless dedication is. I also want to thank my dear friend and stepdad, Hayden Wiskin, who must have read the book at least three times now um, and provides um, just brilliant and insightful um, feedback every time. And also to the rest of my wonderful, supportive, hilarious, surprising, absolute joiners. My family will join in on anything. Um, from mine and Tom's side, the Hodsons, the McKays, the Gills. Hi, um, say hi if you haven't already. Um, thank you so much, dear family. My friends, um, I would crumble without you. Um, thank you for crawling inside my heart and setting up there forever. Um, and now you've started having children and pets. There's even more of you to love. I'm really enjoying that. You know who you are, um, family and friends. You're in the back of the book. Thank you for your brilliance and creativity and for loving a writer um, with weird body things and projects that last for decades, that's, that's hard work and I appreciate it. Um, I just have this dream publication, oh, my mum's sobbing. <laughs> Hi, mum. Um, I had a dream publication run with Scribe. Um, it's the sort of that you read about on the internet, like when you're slogging away at a novel, and people are like, oh my God, I said my novel, and then you said yes the next day, and it was in we all poured champagne, yay! And I'd go and get a bit rolly-eyed and go, oh, that sounds really nice. So, um, I think I sent my manuscript to Marika Webb Pullman on a Thursday, and by Tuesday we were signing up to a year of passionately discussing how an ant or a flea expresses themselves on a page. Um, our meetings would be short 20 minute meetings that would go for hours. Um, Marika is an amazing mind, an amazing person, and has been on the same page with me every step of the way. Um, for the edits, where the book might go to the final gorgeous cover, and this is an illustration by Annie Murphy Robertson, um, who won the Bizarre Art Prize um, the night before I was, I was, <laughs> I was to choose um, the final book cover, and um, she was just there. My earring just burst out of my ear in celebration of her, of her wonder. Um, uh, oh, and um, the scribe team, what a lovely family. I completely adore them all. I'm a bit obsessed. I take liberties and, and, I, and I put kisses on all my emails and um, they're just so wonderful. I want to say special thanks to those who've most recently been working their fingers off to get this book out there. Um, Chris Grierson, Chris Black, the Chrises, um, Cora Robertson and Serena Gale. You met Cora before. Um, I mean, they send shiny stickers out with book deliveries. Um, they check in to see if I'm okay. They're the best. Thank you to the authors and booksellers who took the time not only to read this book but to say something so brilliant for the cover quotes and advanced reviews that it made me seem smarter. Um, and to the early readers of this book, um, I have a bunch of incredible readers. We exchange manuscripts. Um, they give feedback that saves the day. And also the writers and readers, like um, many of you here tonight, who've been so supportive now that it's published with your notes and encouragement, um, your social media explosions, your reviews are just, yeah, just um, really keep me going. And it's the same for all authors who are publishing into this time. Um, it means so much. I wrote much of the animals in that country during a PhD at the University of Melbourne. Uh, many people will know or will have heard of the wonderful Kevin Brophy, who was my supervisor, and the fantastic Amanda Johnson, my co-supervisor. Um, the years they spent reading hundreds of thousands of words, many of them terrible, while I tried to solve the human-animal divide forever. Um, 
now that I'm a lecturer too, all of those chickens are, so to speak, are definitely coming home to roost. I'm, I too read hundreds of thousands of words. Um, last year, I was lucky enough to get a job in New Zealand with Massey University. There might be a few of my workmates here um, drinking a little late in New Zealand now on a work night. Um, please raise a chat glass of hi again if you are still up. You are the dreamiest bunch anyone could ever hope for. Our lunch times are um, a social event. Um, I want to hang out with you all the time. Luckily, I do because we live in Palmerston North and only know each other. <laughs> um, I thank you so much. Um, I usually put Tom Doig first on the list of thank yous, but I was really struggling to comprehend how to thank him enough for his support. Um, there was a time in the last decade that Tom lived through and with when this book wasn't going so well and it bore a list of working titles like animals, exclamation mark. Um, Hello darkness, my old friend, was the title that I thought would be quite appropriate. This is my favourite. Nomenclature. Nomenclature. Nomenclature, can you imagine? Um, another one I like is bear with me, like a bear with me. Um, talking animals was a, was a doozy, just straight to the point, this is what it's about. And finally, um, the most confusing title of all, Nebraska. Not said in Nebraska, but yeah, that was... So. <laughs> The plot at that point when it was called All Those Things was rangy and unpublishable. Um, so let's just say that without some astute and forthright feedback from Tom while he had bronchitis, um, we literally wouldn't be here because it wouldn't have been published. Um, right now, he's my bubble buddy. It's weird because I'm talking to you and he's right there looking very pretty. Um, right now, he's my bubble buddy. Um, so he's the only other person I can be in contact with for the next month of lockdown. Um, things haven't necessarily changed that much for us. We still write and edit and snigger and dance and talk about the ever captivating nuances of university administration at length. <laughs> <laughs> um, we lived in Australia and New Zealand when I first moved over for the Massey job and the world just became a bit greyer without Tom. Um, life with Tom is colour and light. It just, it just is better. Um, and I know that every day, and I thank you, my heart. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Aww, cheers. Oh, cheers. Give me more champagne. Cheers. Come oh. on. Oh. Look at this, no social distancing here. No social distancing, no social distancing. No bubbles, bubbles, bubble, bubble, buddy. All right, so I think we've now reached... Uh, the very exciting, whatever's before the penultimate part of the launch, yes. where we're going to do a quick giveaway. Um, yes, yes, so there's going to be a, a giveaway and then we're going to um, segue into the Q&A. So this is for those of you who uh, need a bit of practice typing things up. I also, in all of the amazing messages that have been flashing up, I did see, I haven't fact checked this, but I did see someone flash up that apparently the rapper Eminem has coronavirus, so I thought this might actually be a good time to have a minute silence for Eminem. Oh. No, no, that'll do it. <laughs> not even sure, it might not happen. Um, no, so, so we're going to do a giveaway now. Um, this is for a couple of copies of the animals in that country. Um, so it's basically first in, best dressed with the answers. So if you're ready to go, the first question um, and uh, is what? is the name of the dingo in the novel, The Animals in That Country. Oh, what is, Barbara. What is, oh, 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 all right. Someone said it first. Someone said it first. before Barbara, but we'll, we'll check that out. All right, someone got it right. Excellent. Um, all right. Ah. Ah, nice work. <laughs> Hi, Asha. Okay, now the next, <laughs> damn you, okay. The next one. Um, what is the name of another novel that also has talking animals in it? More than one answer, but the first one wins. Another novel also has talking animals in animal it. Animal Farm from Ellie Collier. Okay, yeah, cool. Ellie. Excellent. Okay, so Scribe has very generously agreed to give a couple of comp copies for those people, so we will sort out all the logistical details of that before the hot colour starts slam down with a sickening finality for a few weeks. 
Um, <laughs> Some of us have really slow broadband, apparently. So oh. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, that, that's definitely unfair. So we're now going to move into a Q&A session, which is going to be wildly unmoderated. What could go wrong? I, I asked that question, and I was like, this is not going to be any moderation issues. And I've been happy to see not a single issue yet. So this is a chance for you to um, ask questions, and I'll, from behind um, the laptop sort of lob them friendly to, to Laura. So any questions? Um, I believe they're in the Q&A section. Oh, they're in the Q&A yeah, section on the well, Excellent. There's a line-up there, so... Um, right, what oh. is this book called? <laughs> Hi, Mandy, Laura here. That's a good one. Um, oh, there's some really nice comments in there, as you can see, in caps lock. Oh, here's, here's one. All right. My question is, what is the intended audience? Adult or young adult? <laughs> <laughs> All the best, oh, Judith. Judith waits and sleeps. Oh. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's definitely an adult novel. There's some salty language, but I don't know. I have fantasised about about the um. If I brought out the young adult version, would there be any words left? Because Jean just swears so much, you know. It, it would be sort of be, yeah. Let's go for the Michael Livingston question. Yeah. Reading this has changed the way I perceive wild animals around me. What has writing it done to your brain, Ooh, Dr. Laura? Good, good question, Michael. Um, I was I was chatting to somebody on Instagram today because I, I worked out how to chat to people on Instagram today. Um, and uh, they they asked a similar question. Um, it yeah, it, it's a bit of a problem. Um, so now I just have very serious conversations with insects and other animals. Um, so. I'm, you know, sitting there at lunch and there's a fly, as, as flies like to do, and, I, and I'm saying to them, um, excuse me, nobody invited you here. No, we don't like you and you are not welcome. And I'm talking to this fly and the fly seems to pay attention and goes away and then I look up and Tom's like... <laughs> so, it, yeah, it, it, yeah it, it changed things, but also the longer I spent looking at animals and trying to work out what they were maybe saying, the less I, I understood. And I think that's the wonder of other animals and other animal bodies and our, and our relationship with them if we can stop and, and have a listen and a look, is that um, there's an endless wonderment and an endless unknowing um, that is utterly beautiful. <laughs> oh, here are some good ones. Um, let's... Someone I think got lost from 4chan, so ignore the top one. Um, how about, what's your favourite animal? Should we start there? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, yes. Um, sorry, I just thought it was a terrifying question. Um, what is your favourite animal, Jack and JM? Hi, family. Um, I don't, oh, look, after like thinking about dingoes for so long, I, I must admit that I am one of those people, I was never really one of those people who looked at animal videos unless I was sort of, you know, researching serious stuff for my PhD. Um, and there are a lot of hard to watch videos in there when you start to look at animal research. Um, but then, now I'm one of those people who actually does take a bit of a look at a dingo, a dingo in the wild um, now and just go, man, that tail, look at that rough. That is just what a dingo. So probably a dingo. Nice. Great question here from Rosa. I'm wondering if this is like our favourite Rosa, the like wild journalist at large, Rosa Ellen. How well, has I'm writing favourite Rosa? Yeah. How has writing the book led you to change your behaviour, e.g. veganism? Um, yeah, it did it it did um it's it for quite a while. I, I was thinking about um all our relationships with animals and um after a while I realised that um, I was still eating them and I didn't want to anymore. As the great Erica Fudge, um, a brilliant philosopher, uh, UK philosopher, says, we do not eat our subjects. Um, <laughs> so if you're spending five to ten years writing a PhD and a novel about animals, yeah, after a while it, it, it changes you. <laughs> Excellent. I think there's a really nice one here from Kristen Krauth. Um, <laughs> Amazing writer in her own right. And um, so supportive of other writers. Yes, oh. a legend among women and men. This um, book is coming out tomorrow. This book is coming out tomorrow. Well, there you go. <laughs> Why did you choose to set the novel during a pandemic? <laughs> oh, um, to be honest, um, 
okay, so there were these people and they needed to start talking to animals. And I was very sick at the time. I'd been bitten by a mosquito. I was sharing sharing um, a virus with a mosquito. So I had this sort of animal-borne disease inside of me. And I realised that they needed to get sick. And um, in a way, I sort of, I've said this before, but I felt like the, the book sort of caught caught something from me and that turned into its own virus called zoo flu. So it started out just as a as really a writerly technique and then of course it just started permeating the whole the whole novel. Good nice. question. So a plot device basically. A plot device. It was a plot device that, that became a pandemic. <laughs> I've got this lovely question question from Bridget Mullane. Oh, hi Bridge. Hi, hi Bridget. Sydney, I think. Yes. Which books would you recommend to read if you loved this book? Oh, great question. Eva Hornung's Dog Boy. Sophie's already said that. That is a book that I I never looked at, at dogs the same way after I read that book. Um, also, Samiti Nam Joshi's The Conversations of Cow. Um, just a, a love story to to philosophical cows everywhere. Um, Marion Engel's Bear, a 1970s novel, is it's a, quite an erotic tale of a woman and a bear. The writing is just absolutely exquisite. Um, also, a big one that really influenced me was, um, was Anna Crean's Us and Them. It's a quarterly essay. Um, when I first started thinking about this book, I was like, but you only write about animals if you're writing kids' books, and that's fine, but I want to write an animal book. And then I read the quarterly essay, Us and Them by Anna Crean and um, realised that it was it was something to seriously consider for a very long time. <laughs> Lovely. There's another question which was further up, and I'm not going to scroll back up because I'm frightened, um, <laughs> but the question was basically um, how do you write different animals differently? So how do you write, say, a dingo compared to an ant? Oh, um, I got really distracted reading the lovely um, things. So what was that question again? Sorry, how do I... How do you write different animals oh. differently? Like, how do you choose to write an ant to differentiate it from, say, a dingo or a whale? How, how did you kind of, yeah, differentiate the animal kingdom? I'm really, really obsessed with dialogue and the way that we represent dialogue on the page and the way that dialogue drives stories forward. And, and I love stories that are all dialogue. Um, Earlier on, in an earlier version of this book, um, Tom read it, and I think Anna Green read it too, and they both said, "Yeah, this is great, but it's a talk, it's a book about talking animals, and there's no talking animals in it. You know, <laughs> what's the deal?" Um, and so I spent a really long time just focusing on the animal dialogue. Um, in the novel, you'll be able to see that um, it's it's very clearly sort of represented on the page. The insects sort of shout on the page in caps locks. The birds have this nuanced italics going on and um, the mammals sort of um, speak in these in these line breaks with um, and Sue is differentiated. She's a bit special. She she often has these aside, so she'll be saying something and then she'll mutter something to the side. So it was very fun. Um, it, it came very late in a way. I was working on it the whole time, but it was really, really hard. I wanted to get it so right. Marika and I talked for a long time about how how it had to be, if we're going to represent them in this way, it, it, even though we can never really know it has to be good. <laughs> Excellent. And I think building on that, this is a question from Pete McGregor, Hi, which Pete. I think is a great question, a follow-up question. He says, we know some animals are more intelligent than others. For example, Kia are amazingly intelligent, slugs maybe not so much. What concessions did you make, if any, when thinking about how different animals think? Were they allowed bigger words? Such a good question. Um, I think that humans are um, not particularly intelligent, um, as you can see from what we've done to the world. I think we're very, very limited in the way that we um, in we communicate and understand things. We're very visual and we rely a lot on what we say and hear um, on our language. Um, and other animals have incredible... Um, senses uh, that are far beyond our wildest dreams. Um, many of us know that dogs have an entire olfactory factory in their head, an entire area of their brain that is dedicated and that's a huge area to smell. Imagine if um, your entire world 
was dominated and led by smell. Imagine if the way that you perceived the world was through sonar. Um, imagine if it was through um, the vibrations that you felt through the ground. And so, like most novelists, I took little bits of information and I ran with them and I really sort of um, tried to uh, allow the animals on the page to see the world through those incredible, extraordinarily intelligent senses that we, we have no idea about. Wonderful. And this is just, I think, a short, sweet question to end on from Ella Holcomb. Mm -hmm. The bit, lovely, wonderful, you know, um, Ella. unique and fabulous Ella Holcomb. Can animals have a sense of humour? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, they're hilarious. They, they stare at us a lot, um, sometimes in fear, but I, sometimes, and I think, complete baffled amusement at, at what we're doing. Um, we're animals um, and we have a sense of humour and that's something that I really wanted to bring out. Um, the commonality between Jean and Sue, I think, in the end, is their shared sense of survival um, and also their shared sense of humour. Um, Jean has had a tough time. She's going through divorce. She struggles um, with alcohol, liking alcohol a bit too much. Um, but Sue has had, the dingoes, had an even tougher time. She was um, taken from her birthplace. She was put on show as a show animal. Um, you know, she was in a cage all of her life until she escaped and, and took off with Jean. So they share this, they share this um, journey, but they know how to laugh about it as well. And I think I get that from my family, who uh, many of whom have gone through a lot of hard times, but who managed to um, laugh through things, sometimes with very, very um, grim humour, <laughs> is something that we share in our family. Um, so perhaps the animals in this book are a bit grimly humorous. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Give yourselves a round of applause. Oh. Clap, 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 clap. That was wonderful. Um, what I'm going to... What I'm going to try and do now, hello, um, is wrangle a little sing-along, um, uh, animal-themed, isolation-themed, uh, happy sing-along. Um, so you can sort of like try and guess amongst yourselves what you think the song What do you think the song be. is going to be? And if we could choose anything that was an animal and isolation song. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> and the answer, <laughs> the answer is... Octopus's Garden, hooray! And is this going to work? Um. Okay. Um. I'd like to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. Perfect isolation song. Let us in, knows where we've been. And a doctor, a sea garden, in the shade. Sing along at home. I'd like my friends to come and see me. I'd like to be. Apparently, Ringo wrote this when he was singing the Beatles and wanted to hide from them under the sea. He would be warm in all of the storm. Oh, yeah. Now he's will hide away beneath the waves. Resting out there on those deep beds in an octopus's garden near a cave. We would sing and dance around because we know we can't be found. Probably stolen from Dabba Day 7 just before Jeff. Thank you, David. Under the sea, in an octopus's garden, in the shade. Musical Interlude. Musical Interlude, where I thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your questions. I'm going to read back over them. Uh, well done to the people who won the copies of the book and answers so quickly with their speedy internet connections. I hope that you're all okay, um, and I love you so much. <laughs> and still about the coral that lies beneath the waves, up in the ocean waves. Oh, my joy, for every gallant boy, knowing they're happy and they're sad. 